Welcome back to Solving Basketball. I am Jordan Sperber, and we're back. And right before the season started, we had three coaches on, uh, but this was never meant to be exclusively a, a coaching podcast. It's a college basketball podcast, and kind of inevitably with with my interests, we focus a lot on coaching. But today's guest, uh, I'm really excited for, John Azekowitz. He previously worked as a consultant for the an analytics consultant for the Phoenix Suns from 2011 to 2013 and he was also the co-president of the Harvard College Sports Analysis Collective which that combined with the fact that he's maybe most importantly just a huge college basketball fan whether you know him by name or not you probably are familiar with with uh, a lot of his work and that's that's what we're going to get into Thank you so much for coming on, John. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time, and, and we've been planning this for a little bit, so so thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Jordan. I'm, I'm uh, excited to be a guest and talk a little bit about my, my prior career and my current college basketball uh, fandom. I want to get into that, but you know the first question, I think. Uh, I think you've listened to some episodes in the past. So if we walked into a gym right now, and I went under the basket, and you went to the to the free throw line and shot a hundred in a row. How many would you make out of a hundred? Uh, so I think the first thing uh, your listeners need to know is that I'm probably the person who's been on this podcast who has played the least amount of organized basketball. <laughs> the last time I played organized basketball was in middle school, uh, and I probably haven't played pickup for three or four years. But I did know this question was coming, so. While I was home for Thanksgiving, I went out to uh, the hoop in my parents' driveway, and I, I didn't shoot 100 free throws, but I did shoot 50, um, and I made 29. So I, I would give myself somewhere between 55 and 65 free throws. Okay, and you, well, first of all, you said outside and no rebounder. Is that right? I, I did have a rebounder. My brother did rebound for me, which was nice of him. Okay, okay, so that helps. I think that indoors is easier than outdoors. So maybe uh, maybe we can bump you up a little bit. But I would say that being in the 55 to 65 range for no organized basketball since middle school and, and you don't play pickup anymore, I, that seems pretty decent to me. Well, I, I'll take it. To be honest with you, I, I started 8 of 20, but I made, uh, I made 21 of my last 30, so it was respectable. So hot hands? Exactly. That's jumping too far ahead. <laughs> what is basketball? What is what is, what is, what is, is this basketball? Is that basketball? What is what is basketball? Well, okay, let's let's first go into your background. So you mentioned the lack of a playing background, but I I alluded to the hot hand there and just so listeners know for this podcast, John's done a lot of uh, pretty important, in my opinion, anyways, important college basketball research uh, in the field for different uh, different topics, and we're going to kind of jump around to some of those different topics. Let's start out with, I guess, how you got involved doing this type of stuff, especially why college basketball, and uh, you know, while you're at Harvard. Sure. So um, I, I, you know, since I was a little kid, have been a big basketball fan, both college uh, and the NBA. Um, I grew up going to Boston College games when they were actually good, uh, when they had players like Troy Bell, Jared Dudley and Craig Smith. Um, Ironically, that coach, Al Skinner, probably, as you've highlighted, coaches one of the um, least analytics friendly styles of offense. But at the time, it it worked very well. and I've also always been sort of a numbers guy. And, and I don't know exactly when I first stumbled across Ken Pomeroy, but it was probably through basketball prospectus um, in the early 2000s. And, and I loved his, his website. And I thought, gosh, these are, these are tenants that seem to make a lot of sense. You know, basic things like using rate instead of counting, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to go to Harvard for my undergrad and, there were like-minded folks um, who had started a club called uh, the Harvard Sports Analysis Collective, um, where they were looking at uh, the burgeoning field of analytics across all different types of sports, baseball, football, uh, basketball, and soccer. And and that group has gone on to have uh, 
folks work for NBA, uh, MLB, uh, NFL, and professional soccer teams. So um, I joined that group and really from there got the chance to bounce ideas off a lot of really bright people and, and work on some analyses that um, I, I felt were interesting but had not had numbers put to them. Some of them I think we'll get to um, a little bit later. And one of those analyses, which I wrote about um, about intentionally fouling up three, got a lot of attention. Um, and, and actually Luke Wynn from Sports Illustrated picked it up and, and wrote about it. Uh, and, and the new GM of the Phoenix Suns at the time, a guy named Lance Blanks, uh, was looking for – probably somebody who was going to come relatively cheap, which I certainly did to help out with their basketball analytics effort. Uh, this was in 2011. And at the time between seven and 10 NBA teams actually had folks focused on analytics. Now that number is maybe every team with the exception of the Knicks. Although I think the Knicks actually do have somebody, uh, it may not be apparent from their on court performance. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, I was lucky enough to, to get the job. So uh, I, I worked for the Suns for three years, um, doing a lot of, of their on-court analytics and then especially focusing on topics like free agency, player quantifying player performance, the value of draft picks, and the NBA draft. Um, I think unlike some of the other folks you've had on your podcast, I made the decision after I graduated from Harvard to, to go into a different career. I, I work in finance, but I am still an avid uh, college and NBA basketball fan and still write some, do some analyses and, and write some things on the side relatively infrequently now, unfortunately. When you got hired by the Suns, you were, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but still at Harvard. Uh, so I'm assuming you were working remotely. And so I'm curious, especially this is, this is 10 years ago now. I think that probably analytics, even at the NBA level, were less integrated. People were less familiar with uh, how to necessarily use this information and build it into the decision-making process. So how did that work, being someone who was working remotely to still make sure that your your uh, research was being properly implemented or evaluated? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a, certainly a challenge we face. I worked with a professor um, from the University of Kansas named Steve Alardi, uh, who was one of the first people to quantify adjusted plus minus. And we, we were both remote, although we did try to make it out to Phoenix um, four or five times a year, uh, especially re around times like the draft and free agency training camp and then trade deadline and during the season. Uh, one of the it was an organization that was very new to analytics. The, the scouting, the coaching staff did not have much, ex much exposure to it. Um, and so there was a level of, uh, of a learning curve. And, and frankly, I was a college kid, so <laughs> they were more used to coaching one and done than talking to a sophomore in college about, you know, how many threes you should shoot in the game. Uh, but I think one of the things that I learned, which I think has rung true with other of your guests is that, it's not just about the analysis you do. It's really about how you communicate it um, and, and being able to put it in terms that make sense to folks who have spent a lot of time playing basketball and are certainly experts, but may not have the language around um, efficiency or regression analysis or the statistics that that was very important. And one of the things that I found in, in my work with, with scouts and coaches is that they added a lot. To the, to the work that I was doing, suggesting new analyses, thinking about different problems or a problem in a different way than I would have because, you know, they've actually lived it and done it and breathed it. So I think that the, the communication style was something that evolved. And, and I really viewed myself as less of a, uh, you know, a statistician as a, than a translator, somebody who was going to take uh, a piece of analysis that may come from a different lens than a pure basketball one and put it in a format that was easily understood and then have a debate about it. Because ultimately I think that they added to the work that we were doing. That makes sense. And I think that we're probably going to get into that even more as we go through some of your work where you can see that whether it was you who started to add nuance to the conversation, or maybe some of that was added through the coaches that you had talked to. It's, it's apparent in your work. 
I guess two more things um, on the Suns, and, and then we'll we'll move into the the good stuff. I guess this is now again a while back, and I, I'm not a hundred percent clear on on like the timeline of of like sport view data ever, uh, and that type of thing. But what were the what were the main data sources in your time working for the Suns? So it, it's funny you mentioned sport view because sport view uh, came into being while I was. Uh, working for the Suns. And it was actually something where we were the 10th team to buy the sport view data. And we bought that for the 2012, 2013 season. And it was, uh, you know, stats Inc at the time was making the pitch to teams that yes, it costs uh, a little bit of money to install these cameras, but the more teams do it, the better the coverage is going to get and the better the stats will get. And I think they made that pitch so successfully that the year after I left, the NBA actually um, mandated it for all teams, and I and I think picked up the cost for that. So before I start before Sportview, uh, for on court stats, the main the main things that we used were Synergy, um, which has its pluses and minuses, but is still a really great tool. Uh, and then we would use uh, parsers that we wrote of play by play data in order to come up with stats like adjusted plus minus. Um, and some of the contextual things you can't get from a box score, but you can get from play by play. And so that's interesting because those are probably there, there's still no sport view data. And, and for listeners that aren't familiar with it, uh, that's the, the tracking cameras that are in every NBA arena now that uh, track X, Y coordinates of every single player. And it, it obviously is like the next frontier uh, of of basketball analytics at the college level. uh, We pretty much only have that data for the teams that play in NBA arenas. I don't think that they're necessarily even using it that much. If you do want to do college basketball analytics work, it's exactly what you kind of just said. There's synergy data and there's, there's play by play data. And I think that it's a good point about how sport view or stats Inc made the, the case to, to invest more money uh, for for like the long term viability of of analytics, I don't think that's necessarily. College coaches are definitely very interested in analytics, and they, I mean, there's there's absolutely an, an interest, but I don't think that it's led to like a lot of money being spent necessarily. I would be curious your opinion on that. Let's just stick with a high major program that has a lot of resources. Do you think that's a, a way to gain a competitive advantage for, for um, like an ACC school or a Big Ten school or something like that? Um, I, I think if it's done correctly, it, it certainly could be. Uh, one of the things that I think, you know, with the, with the camera systems, whether it's Sport View or Second Spectrum, you, you also need people who are going to be able to parse through that data and come up with actionable takeaways from it. So just having the data itself is is more likely to confuse than um, than actually improve your your outcomes on the court. The other thing, obviously, with college is you have a much smaller sample size, uh, and if you're a high major team, a lot of those games in the non-conference frequently are blowouts that have limited predictive um, you know predictive ability. They have some, but they have limited predictive ability, especially for an individual player. Um, going into conference tournaments, conference and, uh, and NCAA tournaments. Um, with that said, I think that a, a forward-thinking conference, the way I would think about it is a conference should do this, right? If a conference like the SEC or the ACC wanted to spend the money and mandate that uh, every team in the league had cameras, I think that conference could actually realize, you know, a, a, a potential advantage over the course of a couple of years of having better teams. Um, because of that data. So I think that one team alone is going to find limited value uh, from from this type of a system, but something a little bit more coordinated could be uh, very interesting. That's a great point. And I guess that Synergy is actually kind of an example of that. I think when coaches think of Synergy, they think more of the video side, probably understandably so, but it's video and and data as well. And that's that's conference mandated. So there there's an area where... Uh, where that did, I mean, pretty much ob- objectively speaking, by everyone opting in to Synergy, it advanced a lot of things in college basketball, both stats and film. 
And then my last question here before we get into the meat of the, the podcast is you mentioned how you're a little bit different from some of the other guests that have been on here in that you no longer work in in basketball or pursued it even. Uh, so I guess my, my question for you would be, was there consideration after working for the Suns to continue in the NBA or, or in basketball in general? Yeah, there, there certainly was because I loved my work for the Suns and, and I, I loved the organization um, and the people and, and the idea of continuing to work in the NBA was very appealing. Um, for me, one of the things I struggled with is that, that being an analytics-driven front office uh, in any major sport is extremely hard, um, especially in the NBA, which is such a star driven league. So having one or two or three, if you're lucky, really good, uh, you know, of the top 20 players in the league is how you win a title and, and success in the NBA and most other um, major sports is, is measured on that. And really there are only three ways to get those players. One is to draft them which either requires being at the top of the lottery in the right year or, you know, being very good and, and frankly getting a little bit lucky and getting a star like a Draymond Green lower down in the draft. The other way is to acquire them in free agency, which, you know, that also requires, number one, having cap, cap space in the right year, and number two, being a destination where a player actually wants to go. Uh, and then the third way would be through a trade, which again is, is very hard. Uh, and, and lifespans of NBA front offices with the exception of, of a few are, are very short. And so I felt like I was going to be frustrated a lot of my time <laughs> working in the NBA. Um, and, and whereas I, I thought, you know, I can get a lot of the benefit of it. Um, by being a fan. And I had an opportunity to, to do, uh, to pursue another one of my passions, which is um, investing, uh, which I think tackles a lot of similar skill sets of trying to figure out how things work, picking things apart, looking at um, and trying to be a contrarian and find a new angle on things. And, and it felt appealing to me. It felt like I could, I could try it. And if I really, really was pining for basketball, I could come back to that full time. And it's been a situation where I love what I do right now and I get, you know, the, the joy of being a fan. So I, I don't, I don't miss it every day. There are days that I do miss it, but I felt like, I felt like, uh, I had an opportunity to get the best of both worlds. Got it. The part about being able to be a fan, it does almost fundamentally change when you're working for, for me, it was in college basketball uh, it, it becomes hard to be a fan. It, it's there, it's a fine line then between like work and, and, uh, and something that was a hobby growing up. And yeah, it's, it's something to think about for, I, I guess there's a portion of, of this podcast audience is probably people that are interested in basketball analytics or sports analytics and thinking about trying to make a career out of it. Let's shift now to our first stats topic question that we want to look at based off of your previous work and that is the i guess i'll call it the hack a shack you did a 538 piece on deandre jordan who was who was being fouled intentionally at the time i think maybe the college basketball example right now is probably yudoka azabuki or taco fall last year i think hack a shack is the standard terminology for it where you have a, a big who dunks the ball a lot you know is tough to guard around the around the basket and shoots really poorly from the free throw line I guess it, it, can you talk about that uh, 538 article and why there was more nuance involved to the, to the numbers than uh, might first jump out at you sure uh, so uh... For, for those who, who may not remember, because the NBA has made some rules changes to cut down on this practice, there was a time in the four or five years ago when the hack of DeAndre Jordan, the hack of uh, an Andre Drummond was a nightly occurrence uh, in the NBA. And, and both of those guys were, were bigs who shot right around 50% from the free throw line. And uh, I think DeAndre at one point was shooting in the mid 40%. And the idea was, okay, you know, the Clippers, 
they might score a little bit more than one point per possession on average on offense, you know, call it 1.07, 1.08. If I fouled DeAndre Jordan and he's a 45% free throw shooter, my expectation is he's going to score about 0.9 points per possession on those free throws. Uh, And so I'm going to pick up efficiency. I'm going to make a good expected value decision by hacking DeAndre. And I can do it with, you know, perhaps uh, somebody on the bench who I don't really care whether he gets into foul trouble or not. And that, that basic logic, I think, holds a lot of appeal. But the interesting thing about it is that it ignores the context around what happens when you actually foul a player. Uh, so the first thing is, typically that possession is going to be a half-court possession. As you may recall, there have been instances where there have been fast breaks and uh, teams have tried to intentionally foul the big guy in the backcourt while a guard makes a layup. And uh, by rule, you get the layup and you get the free throws. So teams typically only will do the hack of strategy in the half court. So half court possessions are already less efficient than a team's overall offense because they don't get the benefit of fast break and transition points, which are the most efficient way to score in, in all of basketball. So instead of maybe the Clippers scoring 1.08 points per possession, uh, the real comparison you'd want to do is against their hacks court offense, which might be a little bit, you know, just north of one points per possession. The other thing that you have to consider is that by hacking a player, you're putting them on the free throw line and you allow the, the offensive team, the one shooting the free throws to get set in its defense for the next possession you basically foreclose the opportunity to end your possession on defense with a steal uh, and a live ball turnover, which again leads to transition, which leads to you know more points for you. So when you account for the fact that a team, you're allowing the team who you've hacked to get set on defense, it lowers your expected points on the next possession. And then the last thing to consider, and this is something that also comes up with intentionally fouling late in the game, is that at least for the Clippers and and other NBA teams, and I haven't looked at this in college, when they have a free throw shooter on the line who they know is likely to miss, their offensive rebound rate on the missed free throws is much higher than than just sort of your average garden variety free throw rebound. And that could be because they're actually trying, or it could be because those free throws are – frequently, you know, taken by a bad shooter. And so they bounce in, in strange ways or, or some combination of the two. The, the Clippers, when I looked at this, were actually really good at it. So they rebounded over 20% of DeAndre's missed free throws, and they scored a really high rate, um, something like 1.4 points per possession uh, off of those free throw rebounds. So when you put all that together for the Clippers, you ended up in a situation where their expected value based off of their free throw rebounding, the fact that they were getting set on defense and the fact that the opposing team couldn't get a transition opportunity with fouling them in the half court, their points per possession when DeAndre Jordan was getting hacked were basically equal to their points per possession when they were in an other half court offensive possession. So I'm not saying that the strategy was, Uh, a flawed strategy. There were uh, frequently cases where it made a lot of sense, but it was not nearly as clear cut as the simple math might have made it look. Well, first of all, it's it's an interesting topic just in the context of whether you should hack a shack or not. Uh, But then it also has applications to basketball analysis uh, from a more general perspective. So if we go back to the Clippers example, okay, DeAndre Jordan shoots 40 something percent from the foul line. They score 1.08 points per possession. Just right away, you have math that is that is in favor of the foul. And then you talk about how the half court possessions are what you should really be comparing it to. And I think that actually is something that plays a big role in all of, of basketball analysis. So something like a post up or, a, or an isolation uh, if you look at synergy data, play type data, the efficiency on post-ups and isolations in a vacuum are very low, but a lot of times those are happening with 10 seconds left on the shot clock. At that point, 
there's no magical play type that you can create and that you can generate that really is going to significantly increase efficiency. Now, there are probably some things that you can do marginally, but this this is what I wanted to get into in the discussion. Sometimes the numbers are almost too surface level. But one thing that I was thinking about before this podcast was a, I, I don't know, I don't know if you saw it, but an article that uh, Seth Partnow at The Athletic wrote about how the standard for for analytics from like outsiders is is almost too high like they want the analysis to be perfect whereas it's it's i think he called it the art of being less wrong and i can definitely see that side and and agree with that but then sometimes i can agree with the coaches too where there's so much to account for and it's it's too surface level that even if perfect is too high of a standard it still isn't meeting that standard where do you fall on that spectrum well, I, 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 maybe I'd actually turn it back to you and ask you a question. When you have been working for college teams, if if a coach um, drew up a new inbounds play, for instance, a baseline inbounds play that they wanted to run that they thought was better, what would be the percentage improvement that they would want to see, whether they quantify that or not, where they would say, you know what, yes, this is something that we should add to our arsenal that we should keep doing? Because my guess is the inbound play doesn't have to score every time for them to want to put it into the playbook. Yeah, that's so that's a, a great point. Are you getting at to make marginal marginal improvements with, with analytics? Like sometimes the standard for analytics is held higher than like this one little out of bounds play a coach is maybe obsessing about to try to get an extra something like point one. Uh, points per possession and, and point one might be too high even yeah so yeah that that's a good point yeah i i, I think that um it, it's easy for it's easy for somebody who is on the inside to take something that's foreign and say it needs to be you know way better for me to want to incorporate it while being blind to the fact that they work every day on improvements in the domain that they know, whether it's, you know, drawing a play or your rebounding ability or, you know, how you're covering pick and rolls that also are focused on making marginal improvements, but they've done it all the time. That's what they learn to do. That's what they're, you know, really familiar with. And I don't say that to, to belittle those, those, those things. I mean, th- th- that's how you make a great basketball team, but, also how you make a great basketball team, in my opinion, is using numbers to your advantage. And those don't have to be massive jumps in performance for that still to be valuable. Mm -hmm. So let's go to another topic on fouling still, but I know that I want to say that you wrote maybe the original uh, foul up three piece back when you were at Harvard for whatever reason, the coaching perspective is that the the data and the analytics say to foul. You did the original study, and so what what was that data? So this was uh, this was back in in two thousand nine two thousand ten, which feels not as uh, not as far away as it actually is. Um, where I looked at every game that had been close and late, where a team had a chance to win uh, on the last possession of the game. Um, and, and I looked at situations where one team was up three and had the decision to foul or not. And I think the interesting thing that came out of my data was that from an absolute numbers perspective with no prior as to whether this is a good idea or not, there was very little difference, no significant difference in the outcomes for whether teams decided to foul or not. And intuitively, I think the idea of fouling up three uh, makes a lot of sense because you force uh, a team that you foul up three, if you do it correctly, and that's a key point that we'll come back to, to to do three things instead of one. So the three things are to make the first free throw, miss the second free throw and get the rebound, and then score Uh, in, in likely, you know, what is a short amount of time. Whereas if you if you are just defending, the only the other team only has to do one thing, which is make a three. And so intuitively, I think those three things seem a lot more difficult than just the one thing. 
what we found in the data, and, and Ken Pomeroy did a, a an analysis a couple of years later with a much larger sample of data, and he had the same conclusion, uh, is that the reason that those three things are frequently as likely as um, the just making a three is that, number one, it's really hard to make a three in a short amount of time when the defense knows all they have to do is defend against the three. So teams shoot a lot worse in those situations than they do in, in sort of normal open play situations. The other thing is occasionally uh, when you're trying to intentionally foul, you screw up and you foul when um, the opposing player is already shooting. And in that case, it's much more likely, especially because the guy who has the ball is likely going to be a really good three-point shooter and a really good free-throw shooter, that they're going to make all three free throws and you're going to overtime. And then the last thing is a similar point to the DeAndre Jordan point, which is when a team knows that they must get an offensive rebound on a free throw and that a miss is coming, they're much more proficient at rebounding it than they are in normal situations. So when you put all those three things together, the the strategy is not as clear cut as people thought. I have the Ken Pomeroy data that you said was a few years after uh, your piece, and he had 676 cases of of teams defending and 138 cases of teams fouling, and the teams that fouled won 92% of the time. The teams that defended won 93.5% of the time. I think the most important point that you made was just because you choose a strategy doesn't mean that it's going to be executed. And that that's kind of a constant theme that I think I talk about a lot with, uh, with ball screen coverage is that you're selecting a coverage or a strategy, but you also have to consider the associated probabilities if that strategy or coverage does not work. It's, I think, a lot more punitive when, when you're not able to foul. But again, um, it's, it's pretty even either way, wh- whether fouling or defending. Yeah, and I, I think I, I, I don't come down one way or the other on it, to be honest. And I, and I think that if you were, if you had a team that was very good at executing strategies that you wanted to implement. And you did this every day, you know, from the beginning of the season, this is, you know, beginning of practice, this is what we're doing. We're going to foul up three in these situations. And you felt like they were very good at getting, you know, boxing out on, on free throws. I think that it probably is in, in theory, the better strategy. So I, I don't, blame teams who decide to foul up three, especially in college where, you know, unless you can advance the ball with a timeout, you're Mm. likely taking it out 94 feet away from the basket. Um, I don't blame teams who do that at all. I just think that you, the, the wrong way to do it is to get into that situation for the first time in January and think, okay, in theory, this is what we should do and not have implemented this, you know, from the beginning of your, of your practice. Um, and, and then hoping that it works. I think that's not the right way to approach that decision. But if you decide you want to do it from the beginning of the year, I think it, um, it's, a, it's a good strategy. <laughs> it's funny you say that uh, because I have to admit that uh, I've been on a staff that was probably guilty of that. I don't even remember if we chose to foul or defend, but I can remember being on a bench uh, on, on one of the staffs I worked for. I think we were up three with less than 10 seconds left and it, it was a timeout. So, so coaches usually huddle internally before going to over to the team and our head coach just mid sentence, just looked at me uh, to, to try to give him an answer on, on what we were going to do. And that was probably as nervous as I've been on, on a college bench because we really hadn't discussed it beforehand like we probably should have, and from there, probably made more sense to to play it out. I I don't remember the result, but I remember the game, so so I can go back and watch it. <laughs> well, well, one one of the things that uh, you know, I, Ken Ken wrote his article in 2013. We have six more years of play by play. So so Ken, if you're listening, 
it's time for an update with a bigger sample set. Um, <laughs> I, I would love to see what the results are for the last five years. There we go. All right, so now let's move on to the hot hand. I actually wrote about the hot hand at Hoop Vision Plus. This is probably about a month ago now. I went to do some research for it. I knew that there was a Sloan paper out there. And I think at one time I knew that, that you were one of the people behind it, but I had forgot. Uh, so when I when I went to start to write this article, I realized, oh, wow, the, the person who, who did it is an HV Plus subscriber. Uh, so we did a little Q&A with you um, over there. And uh, let's, but let's uh, circle back and, and pretend like nobody has read that article. Your research was different from the initial hot hand article. Uh, can you explain that a little bit about uh, the advancement that you did w- with the hot hand? Yeah, so I think it actually ties into several of the themes that we've talked about already, um, which is this was a case of the players and coaches and scouts who I interacted with in the NBA to a person uh, all told me that the hot hand was real. And when I was in economics class at Harvard, the economics professors to a person said, there's no such thing as the hot hand. And in fact, it's one of the best examples of behavioral economics uh, that we can show how there are all these fallacies in human perception that result in people doing things or believing in things that aren't necessarily true. Um, so it seemed to me that <laughs> given what, how humbled I'd been from talking with the experts in the field, the, the players, the coaches, the scouts about other aspects of analytics and how much I had learned that maybe just maybe there was something more to it than um, a paper derived from box score stats uh, and play by play in the eighties. And then watching the Cornell basketball team shoot free throws um, may have found. And, and again, I think one of the things that's worth pointing out is at the time that was the best you could do, but because of sport view data, we had a much more rich data set that we could work with in order to try to control for a lot of the things that happen um, around the hot hand being real. Because if you believe the hot hand is real and you're on offense, you're going to do a couple of things. Number one, if you think you're hot, you're going to be more likely to shoot. Uh, Number two, if you think you're hot and you're more likely to shoot, that shot is probably going to be more difficult. The other thing is, if you are uh, if you're defending a team, if you're if you're playing defense, um, and I'm not saying whether this is a conscious uh, decision on the part of a coaching staff or or um, a, or defenders or just unconscious because they've seen a guy make a couple of shots in a row, you're probably going to defend that player a little bit differently, uh, and and that might mean that you're actually closer to him uh, when he shoots or closer on the catch or changing your ball screen coverages. I don't know but you're, you're keyed in on, on, on that player. Um, and those are things that you can't get by just looking at play-by-play data of makes and misses. But with sport view data, where you know where every player on the court is, uh, you know, every tenth of a second, and you know where the ball is, you can, you can see exactly where players are when they shoot. So where is the closest defender? Is, is he directly in between the shooter and the basket? Where is the shooter actually shooting from? Um, those type of things became available for the first time, really, in, in 2012, 2013, uh, when we were working on this paper. So the, the story is uh, I, I convinced two of my friends, uh, Carolyn Stein and Andrew Boskowski, um, who didn't have a lot going on their senior semester, senior spring semester, to, to work with this uh, on this paper with me. Um, and I convinced the MBA and Sports U to give me the data. Uh, which I think uh, we were very lucky because, you know, subsequent to that, they basically in maybe a year or two later stopped giving data out um, to groups. Uh, and, and we went to work on, on trying to see whether uh, you, could, you could control for some of those omitted variables in the original paper and find a hot hand. You did that, again, by the defender distance, the fact that when a player is hot, their threshold for for what is a good shot or a bad shot changes. So by accounting for all of those things, what was the hot hand effect? Like how large, how small, what was it? Yeah, so so let's talk about the, I, I think that we had two 
maybe three major takeaways. Um, so, so one is that all of the things that we just talked about are, were real in the data. Players were much, you know, much more likely to shoot when they had made uh, a couple of shots in a row. Um, players were more likely to be more closely guarded uh, by measuring how close the nearest defender was. Uh, that's even controlling for shot location, right? So, you know, obviously a defender could be pretty close on a layup, but, you know, it was more for shots further away from the basket. Uh, and players were also more likely to shoot from further away from the basket. So all of the things that, you know, we just posited as as potentially if everybody believes the hot hand happened uh, are real, they, they, they did happen in the data. So then the question is, okay, can you control for that? And so what we what we thought about doing with the help of, uh, of some uh, advisors from the Harvard Stats Department is coming up with a measure of how difficult the shot is. Um, and I think this is now something that um, Second Spectrum and Sportview and the NBA actively track. But at the time, unless teams were doing it uh, privately, this wasn't something that was widely available. So we came up with a metric based off of factors like how far from the basket you are, uh, what type of shot it is, you know, is it a fadeaway versus, uh, you know, a, a catch and shoot or coming off a screen, um, what the time and score in the game was, uh, who your who your closest defender was and how far away he was, and, and then also who you are, right? Because Kevin Durant taking a shot um, is very different from, you know, somebody on the end of a bench taking the same shot. So that 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 allowed us to come up with a metric for how difficult a shot was. And the final thing that we did was we put the, all that together and we said, okay, let's look over your last five shots and we're going to take your expected value. That is, you know, let's say you took five shots that were all 33% chance of going in, right? You should have roughly made one and a half of those shots. But let's say you actually made four of them. Well, then your measure of hotness is not that you were four out of five. It's that you made four when you were only expected to make one and a half. So your hotness is, is two and a half. And we use that to predict whether you were more likely or not to make your next shot. And, and the answer was yes, but the effect was relatively small. It was about two and a half to three percentage points. And, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but I think for a couple of reasons, it's actually the smallest number you could find. Um, because one, when we use regression, um, what we found was a regression basically takes things that are outliers and pushes them towards the mean because it wants to find the closest fit. Uh, and if you're an outlier, like somebody who gets extremely hot, like a Clay Thompson, or, you know, to use an example from college, Carson Edwards, as you showed, um, you're more like, you know, the, the estimate that comes out of a regression is going to be biased downwards towards zero. Um, the other thing that that we found that was interesting was when we didn't account for how difficult a shot was, <clears throat> and and this is you know the same finding that that the original paper found, uh, there was basically zero effect, which I thought was an interesting result because what it seemed to imply was the NBA has figured out that there is some hot hand, but they've also through some combination of players taking harder shots or uh, defenses changing their coverage has rendered that relatively a small effect, you know, close to zero. And that does not mean that there aren't examples of individual players um, on individual nights or over the course of the season exhibiting the hot hand in ways that create a lot of additional points for them. Um, but on average, it seemed that there wasn't a huge hot hand effect that was changing the outcome of, of games. Right. So if we go back to when you said that the that the Harvard behavioral economists thought that this was just a clear example of like irrational behavior and that basketball people thought that obviously there's a hot hand. I think that your paper kind of showed that they're both right in, in a way um, because there was a small effect, but it does it gets balanced out by the heat check you know um, when Carson Edwards if we stay with that example or Clay Thompson comes down and, and takes a shot that's really hard to make regardless of if you're hot or not that's where we get into like the practical implications which um, I asked you about in that Hoop Vision article 
how do you think that coaches or players even, I guess, should be responding to the hot hand? Like what, what would be the rational way to, to play, <laughs> whether it's defensively or offensively? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. <laughs> and I'm not sure that there's a, there's a single right answer. Um, my view would be that, uh, you know, a player actually uh, taking a heat check is not necessarily a bad thing. And taking a harder shot is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I do think that they're likely, they're more likely to make it than they would otherwise. Um, And I think that allowing that freedom for your players is probably a good um, intangible for encouraging them to get hot, encouraging them to, to have a green light if they're a good shooter. Um, and, and that probably is better for your team than, than stifling that, taking a guy out if he's made a couple of shots and then he takes a, a tough one. Um, I think defensively, if you think that your scheme is broken and, and you're being exploited because of a poor defensive matchup, you have the wrong guy in the game guarding um, this player or you're not doing a, a, something right from a scheme perspective, I think you want to change that whether – Um, the guy makes or misses, right? If he's getting open looks and they're good shots, you don't want to give up a high percentage shot. Uh, But I'm not sure that I would actively change something that I didn't think was broken just because somebody's making a hard shot. I mean, you know, if Marcus Howard is going to make a contested 26-footer, I don't think there's that much you can do about that. Yeah, and thinking about that Purdue-Virginia game, which is where... Carson Edwards really got that reputation in last year's NCAA tournament. Virginia, I remember Charles Barkley criticizing them for for not like sending a double team or running at them. And first of all, Purdue was a really, really good offensive team in general. So there's that. You have to compare it to what the alternative would be a little bit. But yeah, they they made tweaks. Like they put uh, DeAndre Hunter on him for a little while. They had Kihei Clark on him. But At a certain point, looking at it from the expected value, that's definitely how it's looked at offensively these days in in coaching. Like whether or not a shot was good or not isn't so much determined by if it goes in, but by the quality. Uh, And and I think that should be the same way defensively too. The other thing from from the paper is that I think that the fact that these things are kind of canceling each other out is maybe that there isn't any huge implications from it that teams actually are acting a little bit and players are acting a little bit more rationally than the economists thought. Yeah, that, that's fair. I, I, and, and I, I do want to be careful because we had one season of data um, in the NBA and, and I think what you'd really want is a bunch of seasons because you can think about, you know, how many shots is five shots? Well, if a, one of the things that we didn't have the luxury of doing was, dropping five shot sequences when say a player had sat um, for a bunch of time in between. Um, There weren't that many of them, but even so, you know, having, having more data would allow you to, to, to see more examples of what we consider to be the hot hand of let's shoot five shots in, you know, six minutes, right. Of game time. Um, The other, the other thing is uh, there were two economists, uh, named uh, Josh Miller and Adam San Giorgio, who who actually also found a mistake in the math that was actually being used in the original hot hand paper and, and a lot of the subsequent reanalyses. And it's probably too complicated, and I might not do a great job of explaining it uh, on a podcast, but if anybody wants to read the paper, it's certainly available online. And, and that suggests that maybe the effect that we found uh, and the effect that that other people have looked at is, is actually too small if you were to apply a different um, a different criteria to it. So I, I want to you know be a little bit cautious about whether um, the market is fully rational, for lack of a better term. But I do think that you know we 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 should trust domain experts more than we do, um, and I think that coaches aren't going to let themselves. And players aren't aren't just going to bang their heads against the wall and let themselves get beat by somebody doing the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. So I, I do think that teams are making adjustments based on perceived hotness, which I think is real. It just shows again, like the complexities with the data, with the the actual math, like the statistical processes, and then 
and then also with the coaching side of things and it's it's why it, you can't be perfect but it's it's being less wrong i guess yeah like seth said all right so two more quick ones here and, and then and then we'll get you out uh, the first one that I, I think you wrote about, I believe, um, when you're at Harvard is momentum going into overtime. You can expand on it, but let's say a, a team comes down or is down by six with a minute left. They come all the way back. They hit a shot at the buzzer to put it into overtime. Does that team win uh, more often in the overtime period? Uh, so yeah, that is exactly the, uh, example I was looking at. Um, and again, uh, this is one where, where Ken Pomeroy followed me up and, and probably did me one better. So we can talk about those as well. <laughs> he really has an, an awesome database to pull from. Uh, but the example that I was looking at is, you know, it, it is a very common trope, right? A team is down five or six and they come back and they hit a three or a two in the last possession to tie it up. They've got all the momentum they're the favorites going into overtime. Um, Well, does it happen? Do do they win more often? Uh, And and when I looked at about 170 games uh, over one season, where my criteria was a team had on the last possession of the game, tied the game up with a shot. um, The answer was no. Uh, Teams were teams who tied it up were expected to win uh, about 52% of the games. Uh, You know, it might make a little bit of sense that, Um, better teams are more likely to come back. If you're a worse team, maybe you don't come back from five or six points down in the last couple of minutes. Um, And they actually won about 52% of the games. Uh, And and what Ken found, and his criteria was a little bit more stringent, was teams that were down five points in the last minute, um, they won 56% of the overtime games and they were the favored team about 52.5% of the time. So there was a little bit of an effect there, but probably not as much as, as commentators would lead you to believe. Okay. The last one, I'm especially curious to, to hear what your opinion and what your research is on this topic, uh, because I, I do some stuff, I feel like, every March on this one. You have... I think for Sports Illustrated with Luke Wynn in the past looked at predicting the NCAA tournament. My understanding of it is under the assumption that that there's something different about the NCAA tournament than maybe the standard game or just using like Kempom's adjusted efficiencies. My question for you is, are there factors and what are they, if there are, that predict NCAA tournament games specifically. So some narratives that might be used are, you know, senior led teams, teams with really good point guards or or something like that. Is that what that research for Sports Illustrated was about? Yeah. So I I will add, I will add one more, which is that um, for for the past, this is the one thing that I still do uh, with, with Ben Cohen from the wall street journal. Um, looking at predicting first round upsets in the NCAA tournament as well. Um, and, and you're right. Both of those things are derived from the idea that the NCAA tournament is different than the rest of the season. Um, and you can think of several reasons why that might be the case. So, so one of them is you're playing in a neutral site, um, typically in an NBA arena or a very large arena where, you know, we can talk about whether shooting is, is worse or not. Uh, Another thing is um, you're typically playing uh, single elimination, which leads to different strategy um, from coaches and and from players and and perhaps a different level of um, desperation. Maybe maybe you don't take a guy out when he's in foul trouble. If he's your best player, maybe you do. Uh, It might be a little bit different. Um, And then the last thing that you could think about is being different, and this is specifically with regards to – the way that people predict individual games and then, you know, run that forward to predict who's the most likely to, to win and what chance do they have of winning the whole tournament um, is the structure of the bracket. So basically, you know, you have a a survival bracket, right? Where you win and you survive and and half the team survives at the end of each round. Um, And in uh, what's interesting to me is that we have, a lot of examples in statistics where we use different types of models to model that than we would to model um, uh, 
and just a generalized outcome. So, you know, when we're when people look at the efficacy of prescription drugs, um, say a drug that fights cancer, they'll look at a, a, a hazards model to predict how long somebody will survive if they have the drug versus if they don't. Um, and you can think of cases where the whole bracket just opens up for you, right, because of some low probability event. Um, and that, that might actually be a different estimate of what, it would, um, what would happen than if you just took the individual game probabilities uh, and ran them uh, a bunch of different times. So all, all that's to say, I, I do think that there are things that are different about predicting the NCAA tournament than there are about just regular games. Um, it's not going to change. It probably doesn't change who the best team uh, is or who is most likely to win, but it might change the relative odds and it might change, you know, individual brackets where, especially if you're thinking strategically in your office pool, you might be willing to take somebody who's uh, not, not quite the favorite because they have a better chance than people expect of, of making it to the final four um, or winning it all. Uh, so, you know, I think office pool strategy is fascinating. Uh, we, we can get into that if you want. Um, but the, the idea that the NCAA tournament is different in some small ways uh, and, and potentially some conspiratorial ways when you, when you hear some of the mid-major guys talk about the refereeing, the whistle they get, um, I, I think is real. Got it. Okay. So yeah, there's a bunch there. Well, in terms of, I guess my original thought about yeah. senior experience or guard play or, you know, is any of that, incorporated into the model or is it like the the survival aspect of it that makes a lot of sense to me but it's it's a little bit different yeah so um let's let's talk about first round upsets for a second and then we'll come back to survival so interestingly i think the number one most important factor of the factors that i've looked at for predicting nca tournament upsets in the first round and, and i'm looking here for teams seated between um three and six, and then, you know, correspondingly between 11 and 14, um, is turnovers. Forcing turnovers and avoiding turnovers. And, and it makes sense in a single game setting that those extra possessions, you know, getting the chance to shoot more matters a lot. And, and so that can certainly come down to guard play and having senior guard play, experienced guard play. I've looked at a lot of other, and, and there are, of course, other factors that matter, like, um, your strength of schedule, you know, if you're a team who is a mid-major who really hasn't played anybody in the top 30 in Ken Palm, and then you show up in the NCAA tournament and you're, you're playing a team that is a high major with high major talent, um, you're going to have a less chance to succeed than if you had played a bunch of those guys in the non-conference. Um, and, and maybe you can speak to some of that in, in your own experience, but um I, I think that some of the things that, that were surprising to me that didn't necessarily predict um, upsets um, by themselves, you know, they were subsumed in the other stats were, for instance, whether that team had been to the NCAA tournament the previous year um, and then minutes continuity from that. So, you know, NCAA tournament experience in and of itself didn't necessarily predict an upset. And then interestingly, um, three-point shooting percentage is not actually a big determinant of at least as I found NCAA tournament upset. Um, and I think that, you know, frequently you think about, okay, how do I, how do I pull an upset? I want to increase the variance. I'm going to pick a team who makes a lot of threes. Um, having the ability to shoot the three by, by offensive rebounding and not turning the ball over seems to be more important. The volume is more important than, than the actual rate at which you make them. That's interesting. So I, I think I've done some, stuff on that as well as far as like the two things that get grouped together for increasing variance and and maybe making an upset more likely is taking more threes and also slowing down the pace you know if the favorite has less possessions to prove that it's the favorite so those i guess intuitively make some sense with, with variance but i from what i can remember it, it doesn't necessarily get backed up by the data yeah i mean i i think Playing fewer possessions, all else equal, is probably better. Um, but teams that play fewer possessions tend to have different traits than teams that play more possessions, right? Mm -hmm. 
And, and so if you had all of those traits, if you were forcing turnovers, if you were good at rebounding, if you, um, you know, had a lot of experience in the tournament and against tough competition, uh, those are things that I think, um, you know, get amplified, but, but it's not the main effect. There, there's one thing on the survival analysis bracket and, and a factor for predicting the NCAA tournament that I, I did want to hit on because I think it's important and it's one that people, for whatever reason, I don't see stats about it in the public domain from Ken or Bart Torvik or anybody else. Um, and it's counterintuitive and that's consistency. Um, so, and, and when I talk about consistency, I, I mean, what is the, you know, let's take the spread, the variance of your offensive and defensive efficiency performances in individual games adjusted for competition across the season. So if I had two teams that had the same overall efficiency margin, um, you know, let's say plus 25, which if we looked at plus 25 right now, that would be, you know, Virginia or Ohio, Ohio state roughly in the current Ken Palm rankings, three and four. So this is a a one or a two seed. And one of them was less consistent than the other. I would actually want the less consistent team and the NCAA tournament, Hmm. because that means that they actually have a higher ceiling because at a a given efficiency level, um, the less consistent team will have gotten there through a combination of, of higher performances and lower performances and the tighter band of outcomes, you might think, okay, in a six game tournament, single elimination, I want to avoid, uh, I want to avoid the, the low outcome. I want to avoid the bad game. But typically if you're a top seed, your first couple of games, potentially your first three games in the tournament are going to be ones where if you play a bad game for you, you can still win. So what I want is a team that their ceiling is going to be higher than everybody else's ceiling when it gets to the Elite Eight Final Four championship game when I'm playing somebody else who on paper is roughly as good as I am. So that's a case where variance is actually a good thing. Is consistency predictive, like from the first half of the season to the second half of the season or from year to year like um, in terms of uh, teams actually being more consistent or inconsistent than other teams? Um, you know what? I, I haven't looked at it in a while, so uh, I'd, I'd have to, I'd want to look at it. I'm not sure. I think it'd be really interesting to see whether certain coaches are, are more consistent by style than others. Um, mm-hmm. I also think the first half to the second half, again, is, is oftentimes hard because of the difference between non-conference and conference play. Um, but uh, it, it would be, it'd be a very interesting question. I'd love to, I'd love to know. Well, that's probably fitting a way to end it with with uh, another uh, getting deep into the weeds of why a topic that seems kind of easy to evaluate is not actually that easy to evaluate. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I think I think that's fitting for the pod. And uh, I really appreciate your time and uh, being able to go back through some of some of your old archives. It's it's all still out there, right? Publicly available for people to, to take a look. Yeah, it's, it's spread across a couple of sites, but the Harvard Sports Analysis blog still has a bunch of it. Um, there's some of it on 538, SI, uh, even Grantland, if you if you go back to the archives, there's a couple of posts up there. So um, my name's pretty unique. If you search it on Google, it's probably going to be me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's all up there. Great. And I will, in addition to the release of this pod, I'll have a um, article up over at Hoop Vision Plus with links to to this stuff. Uh, where can the people follow you on Twitter, John? Uh, sure. Uh, my my name is uh, at John J O H N Ezekowitz E Z E K O W I T Z, and you'll certainly get some college basketball analysis, probably more golf talk than you're expecting. But <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll be I'll certainly be posting about the season as it goes on. Ivy League too, right? Lots of Ivy League. For sure, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a battle in the Ivy this year. Uh, we got three teams: Harvard, Penn, Yale, who are likely top one hundred Ken Palm teams. Um, and uh, the conference tournament is at Harvard for the first time. So, um, as a Harvard fan, I'm I'm hoping we get it done at home. All right. Well, thank you again. Go follow John on Twitter and and uh, check out the old stuff. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.
Man, Check, and Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Tony uh, uh, Kukoc. Uh, 